The Russian government has acknowledged that the country will fall into a recession next year, battered by the combination of Western sanctions and a plunge in the price of its oil exports. The news caused the stock market to drop and pushed the ruble to a fresh record low against the dollar. Our guest this week in our program is Alexander Cooley, professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at Columbia University in New York. Professor Cooley, welcome to our program. It's nice to be with you. Our main focus today in our program is, uh, uh, is on Russia, this country of 140 million people. Professor Cooley, what are the main reasons behind Russian ruble's rampant decline? Well, the main reason has been the uh, drop in uh, oil prices globally. Uh, Russia is extremely dependent on oil exports, uh, and so, um, you know, the, the, the consistent plunge in uh, the price of crude across the world has really hit it. At the same time, Russian government does do uh, planning scenarios for declining oil prices. And here the second factor has kicked in, which was the impact of sanctions. So even though Russia had a plan and the government had a plan to cope with oil prices at, say, 90, 80, 70, and even $60 a barrel, um, what we're seeing in the markets is attention being paid to the, the impact of sanctions, um, especially next year, and the inability of Russian entities, both private and state-run organizations, to roll over uh, the debts uh, that they have. And so it's really the combination of two, declining oil prices and looming sanctions and, and being frozen out of international financial system um, that is leading to this uh, very dramatic fall in the ruble. Uh, how much worse can it realistically get? Well, uh, we can. Uh, we still have a ways to go in terms of collapse. Um, you know, your your listeners might recall 1998, where uh, we had a similar currency crisis, and there the end game was the default of Russia on its international obligations, on its bond payments. Um, so, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, so it's the, the, the government is adamant that mm -hmm. it will. Uh, uh, keep uh, uh, keep uh, the markets open, that it will not impose capital controls, that it will meet its obligations. Uh, but now we're starting to run into issues that the hard currency reserves that uh, the bank has, which at some point seem formidable at about $400 billion, uh, are depleting now. Uh, and that uh, so the Russian given economic all, of, all so, of the obligations mm -hmm. that Russian entities have that have to be guaranteed by someone, if they can't be guaranteed by external financing, they'll be have, to, have to be guaranteed by the central bank. Uh, the reserves don't seem that formidable anymore. And I think you see the markets reacting to that prospect. Like, uh, does the Russian government have enough in store to sort of fend us off? Uh, we don't know yet. We don't know. Mm -hmm. So the Russian economic outlook is at the mercy of the global market for oil. Yeah, absolutely, at the global market for oil. And also what we've seen is, for the first time, a recalculated forecast on behalf of uh, the central bank that uh, the Russian economy is going to contract next year um, to the tune of sort of 4.5%. And so um, not, mm -hmm. the, the, you create these uh, perpetuating spirals where right, you know declining oil prices lead to declines in the currency, um, which also affect investor confidence uh, and, you know, could possibly sort of create a broad sense of panic. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the other part of this is that Vladimir Putin has made a point recently of saying, look, for mm -hmm. us, the reason that we're being sanctioned, um, you know, our actions in Crimea and Ukraine, these are matters of the highest national order and priority. So we are willing to endure economic pain and whatever the West throws at us, um, you know, for this cause. I think at some point recently he compared the status of Crimea uh, to that of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, right? It's that important for the Russian public. So that's going to be tested now. We're going to see how uh, the legitimacy of this regime and Mr. Putin's popularity stands the test of really the first time in his presidency um, a real economic crisis. They fended off the 2008 and 2009 crisis 
quite successfully. Um, mm-hmm. But but this one is really going to test, I think, the pa- the patience uh, and durability of the public. Our sanction is over uh, Moscow's role in eastern Ukraine, making things worse to the extent of uh, hurting Russian banks and investment uh, sentiment in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. So overall, there are estimates that um, all Russian entities have to roll over about $700 billion worth of debt, mm-hmm. um, and about $330 billion of that is uh, held in the private sector. So um, this is uh, a lot of financing that's going to be urgently required. And you know, this idea that somehow they could turn to China, they could turn to Hong Kong, uh, that hasn't really materialized. Uh, you know, one uh, instructive data point that we have here is that uh, on Monday, Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Ross Neft, a uh, state oil company, uh, announced pretty much that it was receiving a bailout and support um, from the Russian government uh, to sort of service its obligations. And uh, that seems to have been an enabling factor in the rapid drop of the ruble. Um, this perception that um, the central bank now was just going to sort of print money uh, and that um, really the credibility of um, you know the Russian economic system and monetary system uh, was in doubt. So uh, the sanctions are biting, but they're biting in combination uh, with developments on the global oil market. Well, Professor Cooley, is there a problem between the Kremlin and the central bank? <coughs> what we're seeing are some... Uh, we don't know if there's a problem. What we're seeing is first visible signs of, of, of disagreement and criticism. Um, you know, the, you know the, the the question about the ruble is an interesting one because for Vladimir Putin, it's always been a status of Russia's resurgence having a strong ruble, right? Um, so, you know, this latest central bank intervention after this overnight meeting, um, you know, where they raised interest rates from 11.5 to 17 percent, smacked of desperation. On the other hand, it may have had some stabilizing consequences. But the long-term consequences to this are going to be, I think, politically disastrous. It's really going to choke the Russian economy um, at a time in which it was already teetering on the brink. So I think the symbolism of the ruble is important for the Kremlin, but I think the central bank also realizes that it's entrusted um, with, uh, you know, trying to keep the economy afloat. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's only so many interest rate rises that can be realistically uh, put upon the Russian public. Um, So, yeah, I think you might see some schisms further develop there. Now, in order to stop the bleeding of the ruble, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced that he would introduce an amnesty on capital return into the country. What does that mean? That means that... Um, a lot of uh, these offshore bank accounts, um, a lot of the capital flight that we've seen really over the past two decades uh, would try and be reversed. That we'd, uh, Vladimir Putin is very opportunistic when it comes to... Is it available to business people, to Russian business people? Yes, that's right. Russian business people, oligarchs, uh, people involved in finance. And, he's, and, and, and he actually never liked the fact politically that you had this group of cosmopolitan businessmen uh, who had their proceeds abroad, not only in bank accounts, but in things like real estate, um, you know, ownership of various sort of enterprises, even football teams, uh, and the like. So he's trying to use this as an opportunity to say, you know, bring your assets back to Russia. Uh, we'll grant you amnesties. We won't fine you. Um, you know, you'll be taxed at a reasonable rate. Uh, you know, come back. And, of course, he sees this as a way to reassert control uh, over this group of people and their assets um, that have really made full use of the benefits of globalization to go abroad. But just to give your uh, listeners an idea, just it's estimated that so far this year there's been $130 billion worth of capital flight from Russia. Right, So all that money goes abroad somewhere, uh, and bringing it back has become an urgent economic but also a political matter uh, for the Kremlin. Now let's speak about the foreign reserves. Are they able to face the decline of the ruble? Um, we'll see. We'll see. We don't know. Uh, mm. that, uh, we don't know whether 
uh, what exactly the extent of obligations are and what extent the, the reserves are. Um, there's been some recent dispute on whether it's in the realm of the re- total reserves are in the realm of sort of $400 billion, whether they're really more like $200 billion. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. uh, the Russian central bank, um, uh, you know, clearly was credible and it was decisive um, mm-hmm. when it came in. Now we don't know, in fact, because the uncertainty uh, about the economic outlook, about sanctions, about the oil price um, are really uh, hitting sort of, you know, you know, the bottom line in the outlook. So uh, I think there are doubts, really, for the first time, and it, it's going to be tested. Is the Kremlin going to, uh, as its population, going to tighten belts? Uh, well, this the is the dilemma. Of course, they have to belt tighten. In some ways, I mean, there's no way around it um, that you know they're having, um, you know, the revenues are in decline and they're going to have to cut uh, expenditures and outlets. Having said that, the fundamental social contract, unofficial, albeit, but the fundamental social contract of the Putin regime was, um, we will improve standards of living for everyone. We'll create a middle class. You will have. A strong currency, so you'll be able to shop and go abroad and take vacations. But in exchange, you don't uh, mess with politics, right? You don't enter the political sphere. That's been the implicit social bargain. And since the beginning of the Putin era, it's worked relatively successfully for the Kremlin. And it's unclear now whether altering that social bargain through slashes in social spending and a weaker currency is going to degrade the legitimacy of the regime. Certainly, it's going to test the regime. Professor Cooley, what is your comment uh, about uh, the recent uh, President Vladimir Putin's visit to India? I think it's clear uh, that the Kremlin wants to try and enlarge its range of strategic partners um, and find alternatives to the West. Um, and, the sign of you Russian know, Mr. economic relations. Economic relations and also strategic partners. And so India, uh, rather, Russia regards India as a BRIC country, as a potential partner in creating this web of relations that are outside of Western controlled international order and international institutions. So this is why. Uh, Russia attaches particular important to non-Western organizations like the BRICS, which India is a member, um, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, why it values its partnership with China uh, and India. So it would like to revolve the strategic partnership and sort of counter um, U.S. relations with India. Uh, but, you know, again, the question is, in the midst of this economic crisis, what kind of standing and what kind of great power authority does Moscow actually have in conducting uh, these overseas uh, kinds of diplomatic uh, visits and these very kind of grand uh, um, uh, types of uh, gestures as to, you know, we're moving into a post-Western or non-Western world, um, they've been at the forefront of this, and, you know, it's not clear uh, what kind of standing Moscow's going to have over the next year to really sort of push this non-Western agenda. Uh, Professor Cooley, uh, another question. How about the impact of the decline of the ruble on the global economy, knowing that, oh. Russia, knowing that Russia is the 28th biggest market for the United States? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the Russian market isn't that important to the U.S. Um, just in terms of sort of pure trade. Um, so, and in fact, I think that's always been part of the problem: the U.S.-Russian relationship that there isn't an inherent set of business interests that want engagement and want to keep the relationship relatively even keel. Say the way there is between Germany and Russia. Um, but I think your point about the. the decline of the ruble's impact on global markets is very good when you're already seeing contagion, uh, certain parts of the world, uh, emerging markets, sell-offs. Um, I think there's a perception that uh, we might be in for um, really uh, a very bumpy sort of 2015 that might, you know, ruin or derail the recovery uh, and sort of, you know, instability in Russia, compounded potentially by even more political instability, depending on how Russia reacts now um, in, in, in Ukraine, uh, I think it's a real concern. And so you're seeing real, uh, uh, not quite panic yet in emerging markets, um, but a real flight uh, away from them.
Mm-hmm. Uh, Professor Cooley, is Russia different from Russia of August 17, 1998? Uh, we will see. We will see. I mean, mm-hmm. I think uh, the, the problem that Russia has with 1998 is it became such a symbol for the failures, right, of the market mm-hmm. transition and democratic experiment. It was the point at which Russia had really bottomed out. So for the Russian government to go into default, impose capital controls, do all the things that would mark their sort of capitulation to the crisis would be a real political and symbolic blow. Um, so certainly they will try and fend this off with every tool that they have, uh, intervening in currency markets, hiking interest rates, trying to reassure investors, guaranteeing obligations. They will do everything they can to not have it reach that stage because 1998 really was the very bottom in terms of Russia's domestic uh, politics, but also sort of Russia's international standing in the world. Professor Cooley, a last question. What are your expectations for the year ahead? Uh, I think it's going to be a very volatile, very interesting year ahead. I think you, we are coming out of a landmark year in international politics 2014 where you've seen a number of events that individually would have been important, right? The beginning of NATO drawdown from Afghanistan, the U.S. rebounds or pivot to East Asia, the Ukraine crisis and this crisis of sort of uh, post-Western order, um, uh, of course, the uh, situation with ISIS in Iraq. So uh, any one of these would have made for a significant year. Taken in combination, I think they point to a real volatility uh, in terms of global geopolitical dynamics and the dynamics of who really gets to set the rules um, and control the governing institutions in uh, the international polity and the international economy. So I expect 2015 will be very much about these lines, like trying to figure out what the architecture is um, in this sort of post-Cold War order uh, and whether um, uh, the U.S. really uh, and its Western uh, kinds of counterparts and actors uh, can really maintain uh, a sense of order uh, the way they have been um, um, traditionally. That seems to be what's on the table now. Professor Cooley, Alexander Cooley, Professor and Chair at the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, New York. Thank you for being with us. It's good to be with you. Thanks. Thanks.